So I'd like to welcome everyone today. Thank you for coming and joining our conversation. I'd like to start by asking for a moment of silence to remember all of those who have been killed and for the comfort of those who are bereaved or injured during the ongoing events in Gaza. As you all know, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the 1948 Nakba, or disaster. But what is happening right now only highlights that the Nakba continues. In the news, we're seeing the wanton disregard for Palestinian life as they seek recognition for their rights and for the fulfillment of promises that have been made. The increasing ugliness of the Israeli army and its five decades old occupation regime is operating with seeming impunity. The expansionist settler movement increasing the displacement of Palestinian residents in Jerusalem and the West Bank. The situation seems to be moving much more quickly, especially since the major shift or seeming shift in US policy towards Palestine. Are the dynamics different? Or does it just feel like it's different? What does it mean for the Palestinians living in Palestine? What does it mean for the refugees who are living outside of Palestine and in refugee camps? What does it mean for the Palestinians in diaspora? Is Jerusalem off the table, or is it still at the center of everything that's going on? This is what we're going to be discussing today. And we have two people who are going to help us to navigate through these issues and try to have a better understanding and perhaps a little bit more clarity about what's happening and what it means. Our host for the conversation today is Helena Cobbin, I'm sure most of you know. She's a journalist, author, analyst, and publisher. From 1974 through 1981, she worked as a Beirut-based correspondent for several news outlets, including the Christian Science Monitor, the BBC, ABC, and I'm sure I've forgotten some, <laughs> I apologize, and the Sunday Times. Then she moved to the United States and took up a research position at Harvard University the Center of International Affairs, where she wrote her first book, The Palestinian Liberation Organization. She has since written many more on the questions of the Middle East, war and peace, transitional justice, and other international issues before founding her own publishing company, Just Roar Books. She continues to be a prolific writer and analyst on these issues on her blog, Just World News, and is a weekly contributing contributor um, for Interpress Service. Of course, she has much more to talk about, but I'd rather hear her speak. And our guest today, um, Dr. Rashid Khalidi. Um, he probably doesn't need any introduction either, but it is my honor to give it a go. Um, <laughs> he's a Palestinian uh, American, uh, historian of Middle East of the Middle East. Um, he is currently the Edward Said Professor of Columbia um, University, at Columbia University, and of Mid the Mid modern Middle East, I'm sorry, of the modern Arab studies um, at Columbia University, and the director of the Middle East Institute of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and the editor and scholar of the scholarly journal, uh, the Journal of Palestine Studies. After graduating from Yale and then Oxford, he went to Beirut to teach at the American University and 
as a research fellow at the Institute for Palestine Studies, writing two books and several articles. And he returned after, in the middle of the, the war, uh, I would say, in Lebanon in 1983 to the U.S. to teach at Columbia University before becoming a faculty member at the University of Chicago, where he spent eight years as professor and director of both the Center for Middle Eastern Studies and the Center for International Studies. In 2003, he returned to Columbia University. He is an author of many seminal books on the Palestinian identity and nationalism and on colonialism in Palestine and the Middle East. There will be time today for your questions too. And you'll notice that we have left cards for you on the seats so that we can make sure to get as many questions in as possible. Um, so just write them down and we'll collect them so that we can then address, start to address the questions at the, uh, at the end of the conversation, and actually at the middle of the conversation. Um, finally, please put your phones on silent so that it doesn't uh, interrupt um, the live streaming and the Facebook and other matters in here and the flow of the conversation. Helena, I would like to welcome you and uh, Rashid. Thank you. for turning up on a beautiful spring day. Um, I guess it's also a beautiful spring day in Jerusalem, let's hope, but um, a huge amount of things have been going on there. I want to thank um, Julia Pittner, the executive director of the Institute for Palestine Studies for inviting me to come and do this. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure um, Rashid Khalidi and I go back a long time, and actually he introduced me to my first husband, but that's a long story. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so Rashid obviously is somebody who knows a lot about Jerusalem, um, and I wanted to ask his first, the first question is, can you briefly tell us about your own family's links to Jerusalem? Who from your family is still able to live there? And just in brief, what are your links? Um, well, there are many people in this room who know, uh, uh, who are Palestinian or know a great deal about Palestine. Um, our family is a Jerusalem family from way back. Uh, there's a dispute in the family how far back, but I'm not going to bore you with, the, with that. Um, but um, it's a family that has been established there for a very long time. There's a street named for us, Akhvat al um, my uncle was the last elected Arab mayor of Jerusalem. So um, it's a family that's been connected with Jerusalem for centuries and centuries. And do you have a family library? We do indeed. Um, a part of the family still lives there. And one of the things that uh, the people who have been able to stay have done is to preserve a family library that was actually founded by my grandfather uh, in 1899 with a bequest from his, from his mother, my great-grandmother, um, and which was made up of books that various people in the family had collected over a couple of hundred years before that. So it's a collection of books that have been in the family, different people in the family, and that my grandfather brought together. And it's in a, it's in a very, very old building, probably 12th or 13th century building in Shar Abad al as you go down to the Haram, with an Israeli checkpoint right outside now. And as I recall, there are Israeli settlers living right above who... There is a yeshiva okay. that took over family property after 67, uh, and that was established immediately by Rav Gorin. Yes, exactly. So um, the reason really that we're all here today is because of, on May 14th, um, President Trump is going to be, well, uh, probably Vice President Mike Pence, or as we learned perhaps more recently, that Treasury Secretary Steve Mnookin is going to be opening the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Um, and that is one day before the 70th anniversary of the foundation of the State of Israel, and as Palestinians call it, the Nakba. So what can you tell us about the implications for the peace process 
of President Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Well, first of all, there is not now and has not been for a very long time anything that could legitimately be described as a peace process. There has been a process of deception to enable the maintenance and strengthening of a status quo of colonization and occupation. The United States has overseen that process, which was not directed at peace, or we would have had peace in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or the 10s or any time in between. So there is not and has not been for a very long time a peace process. Um, what the implications of this move are uh, are actually impossible to tell, but some of, the, some of them are clear. One is that the U.S. government has clearly sanctioned the annexation of East Jerusalem and the territories around it and their uh, uh, being adjoined to the old Israeli Jerusalem municipality. So the expanded borders of Jerusalem uh, and the expanded municipality of Jerusalem is now considered by the U.S. government to be sovereign Israeli territory. Just the other day, uh, the State Department's report noted that from now on, uh, East Jerusalem affairs would be dealt with under Israel and the Golan. So it's part of Israel, as far as the United States government is concerned. Exactly where those boundaries are is not clear. And that same report said this doesn't this doesn't uh, – the, the frontiers of this new Israeli expanded Jerusalem, which we now – the United States now recognizes as sovereign Israeli territory, have not yet been defined. But basically, uh, in effect, the United States has said this is no longer negotiable. As far as we and Israel are concerned, this is Israel. Jerusalem, all of it is Israel. So I think, I think the implications of that are enormous. First of all, in terms of Jerusalem. Uh, which ha is the most important issue remaining between the parties. So the United States has basically said, we've decided the most important issue be uh, between you in favor of Israel. And it's, quote, unquote, off the table. But secondly, because of what that implies for the issue of other occupied territories and the question of sovereignty as far as other occupied territories are concerned. In effect, what Trump has done is to say, the, 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 the passage in Security Council Resolution 242, which talks about uh, uh, the illegitimacy of, 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 of uh, uh, taking territory by war, has just been canceled unilaterally by the United States. So the implications are enormous. Um, which brings me on to the question of the implications for international law of moving the embassy. Um, because originally, all the embassies were in Tel Aviv because Jerusalem was supposed right. to be a, an international, as they call it, a corpus, corpus separatum. separatum. Right. So has that all been shredded? I mean, what's happened to the partition plan? Yeah. Um, the implications are, are far-reaching as far as international law is concerned, as it has done on other occasions, but I think here more blatantly. What the United States has done is to say what we want is what's going to happen, and we don't care about international law. Now, what does international law include? In this case, it includes not just the partition resolution, uh, Resolution 181 of 1947, um, but a number of other resolutions relating to Jerusalem, which declare uh, Israeli settlements illegal, which declare Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem illegal, and which were voted for by the United States. So the United States has now, in effect, gone back on its votes and acted as if binding international law in the form of UN Security Council resolutions or UN General Assembly resolutions have no validity. That's a, that's a revolutionary, very radical step. And it has all kinds of implications for international law, I think. And in consequence, 14 countries in the Security Council uh, would have voted to condemn it, but for the American veto. Right. Um, I guess later we could maybe raise some questions and have a little discussion about the effects on regional politics right. because I gather that King Salman of Saudi Arabia has come out somewhat critical of his crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, who essentially said, ah, that's fine, take Jerusalem. Uh, do I have it wrong? <laughs> I mean, Well, King Salman did say something which depending on how you parse it, could be taken to mean that he is somewhat reticent about this, whereas his son, the crown prince, whom he has enabled and, and made crown prince, so you know, one wonders about what's going on in that father-son dynamic, 
um, has clearly not in any way protested. Quite the contrary. He seems fine with uh, anything the United States does on the Palestine question. In fact, if you take his positions altogether, he's a lot closer to the Israeli position than he is to any Palestinian position, the crown prince. Um, and I think this is a very worrying indication of the fact that the Palestinians do not just face a problem in dealing with Israel or a problem in dealing with their own internal divisions and, 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 and issues, but they face Arab governments, most of them undemocratic, most of them unrepresentative of the sentiment of their people, which are much more eager to obtain the favor of Israel or Washington and Israel than they are to support the Palestinians or to do what their own peoples want. People say the Arabs this, the Arabs that. No, undemocratic, unelected, autocratic, authoritarian Arab rulers who rule by repression of their peoples have taken position X, Y, or Z. The Arabs have not. There's opinion polling done by Jim Zorbi, done by a variety of respectable institutions, which shows that Arab public opinion is very supportive of the Palestinians. Arab rulers who are pathetically dependent on Washington or eager for its favor have different positions. So the Arabs are in one place and the miserable lot of their rulers are often in a very different place. And I think this is a real problem for the Palestinians. It's a problem, obviously, for the Arab world. It's the most undemocratic region in the world. No other region in the world has a set of governments as miserable, as undemocratic, as autocratic as these. These are the only absolute monarchs, monarchs left on earth. These are some of the worst military dictatorships left on earth. And we are saddled with them, unfortunately. So at the heart of the Jerusalem issue are the Palestinians of East Jerusalem who have hung on mm -hmm. um, through 51 years of occupation. Um, what effect do you think that um, moving the, the embassy to Jerusalem is going to have on their situation? I guess they make up around 37% right. of the population of, of Jerusalem. Right. Um, I actually don't think it's going to have that much effect on their situation. Um, Israel ha o has always treated, since immediately after the occupation in 1967, has always treated all of Jerusalem east and west as uh, Israeli sovereign territory by act of the Knesset. So they have been treated as residents without nationality in Israel uh, ever since 1967. That's not going to change uh, in terms of the, the problems that they face vis-a-vis -vis the mu municipality, vis-a-vis -vis the discriminatory laws of the state of Israel, the situation doesn't actually change. Um, more important than that, I think, is the point that you just mentioned, the fact that they constitute well over a third of the population of Jerusalem. This in spite of consistent measures to deprive Palestinians living in Jerusalem of the right of residence, which is stripped from them arbitrarily and system. I've met several cousins who've lost their residency rights in Jerusalem because they're deemed not to have you know, lived there sufficiently. It's not their, 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 their center of life, so-called. Um, this is not true of any other Israeli or of any other Israeli resident. In other words, you can go on vacation and live in Florida for 11 months of the year and come back with your Israeli passport, and of course you're not deprived of your Israeli nationality if you're not a Jerusalem Arab. Whereas if you're a Jerusalemite and you violate whatever regulations they've established, you will be stripped of your Jerusalem uh, ID and therefore of your right of residence. So in spite of those kinds of measures, the Palestinian population of Jerusalem has continued to grow absolutely and as a proportion of the whole. And I think that's more important in terms of the, 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 the situation on the ground in Jerusalem than this action on the part of the U.S. administration. So you don't think the uh, American, let's say, um, recognition of Jerusalem as a capital will, will end the kind of faint bleeps of, of criticism there were when there were new Israeli settlements built in East Jerusalem? You know, I, I frankly am not unhappy to see the United States finally actually acting, uh, or I should say di differently, actually talking the way it acts. The United States has been the indispensable support of everything Israel has done for a very long time. All of its actions, uh, its wars on Arab countries, its repression of the Palestinians, etc., uh, is only possible because of the sustenance and nourishment that is obtained 
from the generosity of American taxpayers who pay taxes so that other people can get 501c3 tax-deductible donations to give money to the Israel Defense Forces or for the building of settlements or for other illegitimate, in fact, purposes that are not charitable. Or because our taxes are going, 3.1 billion and now more, uh, to support the Israeli military machine. They're now all, it's all military aid. So we are paying for them to bomb Gaza. We are paying for them to shoot uh, demonstrators. Um, without that support, uh, Israel could not possibly do what it's doing. And it's slightly less hypocritical for the United States to be talking in the same absolutely, overtly, over-the-top, pro-Israel way that it has been acting for all of these years. So I, 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 th that actually doesn't bother me one bit, the, the fact that their actions are now – their words are now cons more consistent with their actions. I guess uh, coming back to your point about the peace process, some of my friends used to say that the, the whole point about the peace process literally and figuratively was to keep Palestinians occupied. Hmm. Um, yes. Th which the PLO has been occupied with like various rounds of negotiations and you know the news cameras go to Taba or they go to here or they go to there and PLO negotiators have you know, flown first class hither and yon, and it's kept them very occupied. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess you have a, a good point that this kind of cloak has now been stripped off to a large extent, and and this city, Washington D.C., has declared itself at the official level to be fully supportive of Israel on Jerusalem, which. Mm -hmm which you described as the heart of the issue, but there is also the right of return. Mm -hmm. um, so actually that applies to many people in Jerusalem as well. There are Palestinian refugees in Jerusalem. Um, and there are Palestinian refugees from Jerusalem who are not allowed to return. Right. Or, or Palestinians deprived of their residence who are not allowed to return, or others from Jerusalem who are not allowed to return. Yeah, I think actually West Jerusalem is probably the most thoroughly ethnically cleansed of all the major ur urban areas in 1948 there is a, Israel. There is a mistaken impression that West Jerusalem was always predominantly and only Jewish. In fact, most of the Jewish population of, of Jerusalem before 1948 did live in West Jerusalem, but there were large areas of West Jerusalem that were Arab. Um, and in fact, there were 30,000 people living there, all of whom were expelled in uh, April and May of 1948. So there's a very large Palestinian urban population in Jerusalem who were made re forcibly made refugees um, in the lead up to May 15th. They were, they were all driven out well before May 15th, as were the urban populations of Jaffa and Haifa. So 60,000 there, 60,000 there, 30,000 there. That's 150,000 of the, of the 300,000 people made refugees before May 15th, 1948. Half of them were urbanites and 30,000 of them were Jerusalemites. So I guess this is coming very close to what's happening in Gaza where the population is, as we know, 70% made up of refugees. And the, the uh, mass nonviolent actions that we see in Gaza right now have as their organizing um, theme the right of return. So um, as I, I guess I wrote recently, during the Oslo period, people would – say, especially here in Washington, D.C., you know, the right of return is essentially off the table. Jerusalem can be finessed. And these were sort of swept to one side as these endless rounds of negotiation took place. But now both issues are coming back, um, especially the right of return with these amazing, large, nonviolent marches in Gaza. Um, how do you assess this protest movement? I think this is the third – it may develop into what I would describe as the third major grassroots upheaval in modern Palestinian history. The first was the general strike of 1936. The second was the first intifada. And if this continues to develop, it may turn into the third. These were things which in every case – the political leadership had absolutely no connection with, did not initiate, was surprised by, and then tried to hijack or take over. That's what the Hamas leadership in Gaza is trying to do now, to, to 
piggyback on what started uh, as a civil society movement by activists. Um, in all of these cases, um, these were largely nonviolent to begin with. In the case of, of, the, of the 36 general strike, it eventually turned into the great Arab revolt of 1936-39. Um, in the case of the first intifada, it was followed by a much more violent second intifada. So far, this has been almost entirely nonviolent. Um, and it has been a grassroots movement. So that's the first thing I would signal. This is really quite important in the sense that it represents a response by the Palestinians to the incompetence, the, the failure of their leadership, the absence of a strategy on the part of their leadership, and a movement from below to do something. And y as you point to, it, it is focused on what most people consider the most or one of the most important issues, which is the fact that they have been turned into refugees and lost their property and demand their rights is specifically the right of return and the right of, 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 of being compensated for their stolen property. Uh, this is really quite important. Um, as you say, it's brought it back to the center. I frankly think that the Trump action on Jerusalem brought Jerusalem back to the center as well. The, it, it, it has been technically taken off the table, according to the words of the president, but I think we're paying more attention, people are paying more attention to Jerusalem as a result of the United States doing this. And we'll pay, pay even more uh, uh, as a result of all of the fanfare that's going to surround the actual opening of the embassy. So the issue of Jerusalem is on the table, in fact, and the issue of return is on the table. Uh, in, the, in the first case, because of what this administration has done. In the second case, because of what activists and young people who are willing to be murdered, shot, uh, as, 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 as y y you mentioned, you, you wrote this the other just, just today, uh, 39 people killed over 5,000 people wounded. There were not 39 people and 5,000 people doing anything that endangered the life of one Israeli soldier. Not one Israeli has been wounded or harmed in any way by these actions. They were essentially nonviolent. Thousands of people were shot down, wounded. Thousands, uh, three dozen, over three dozen were, were killed. Uh, my guess is that the killings were often targeted assassinations of people chosen as activists, either because the Israelis knew who they were in terms of something else they were doing or because they, they knew they were doing what they're doing. Any of you who haven't read it should read Ronan Bregman's book, uh, Rise and Kill First, A History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations. You will have to take a shower after each chapter. You'll have to wash your hands after turning the pages. The book is covered in blood. It is a very well-sourced account based on Israeli intelligence and military sources of literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of assassinations of Palestinians. And it talks about various periods in which this policy evolved. And what it's evolved into now is the calculated murder by snipers and drones of individuals chosen for death. And in some cases, these are people involved in military activity and violence, and in many cases, they are not. Vasen Kanafani barely knew how to handle a pistol. Uh, Kamal Nasif uh, was not <laughs> a man of violence. These were writers. They were murdered. Uh, and it's their, their, their assassinations are described in great detail in this book, as are activists in Gaza now being murdered. Uh, essentially because they are involved in this, in this, uh, in this not, initiative. Not one of whom has been seen or, or suspected of actually taking up a weapon in the course of this, this action. The, 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 the these events have been covered by the Israelis, by journalists on the spot, and, and by the international media, and nobody has seen a weapon anywhere. Uh, there are not any weapons. These are essentially nonviolent protests. The Israelis complain about there's damage to our security infrastructure. If people could be damaged for, it could be could be murdered for damaging infrastructure, a lot of vandals would be dead today all over the world. But most police forces and most security forces would not be allowed by the law to 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 murder people simply for damaging property. And and of course, international humanitarian law does govern what you can do in in contexts of occupation, military occupation, as well as contexts of, of combat. Um, I I just want to note that one of the people assassinated was this, this wonderful young videographer, Yasser Murtaja, who made some videos for my company, Just World Books. Um, and those videos, for some reason, were taken down by YouTube. Cute, adorable videos of young people from Gaza reading their own stories. He did the videography for my cousin Basma Sharif's film on Gaza. 
Uh, he's a he was a, a Allah yarhamu. He was a very very talented man, uh, a wonderful artist. Uh, if any of you have a chance, look up Basma Sharif. Uh, I forget the title of the film. It's a wonderful, very innovative film. He did the videography for. So you know there there is a question for us here in the states and internationally of what is YouTube and what are um, Twitter and all the other platforms that we use to communicate. What are they doing to help suppress Palestinian voices? Um, but that's probably a different issue we need to um, look at another time. Um, Rashid, well, first of all, just coming back to the issue of mass protest. Last July, there were stunningly successful mass protests in Jerusalem, um, as you might call them, mass pray-ins mm -hmm. um, by Muslim Palestinians protesting. There weren't just Muslims. <laughs> there were priests in the front row of the protests. <laughs> They were Palestinians <laughs> involved in a prayer, and you're right, so mainly Muslim. <laughs> so, so will and and they actually succeeded to some extent in in stopping the the change in the access rules. The grassroots, mass-based protest movement against the installation of new cameras and new uh, metal detectors around the gates of the Haram al-Sharif were more successful in protecting the status of the Haram al-Sharif than all the miserable Arab governments, <laughs> the PLO and the PA, since 1967. More was done. There was a greater degree of success. Actually, they succeeded completely. Mm -hmm. The cameras were taken down. The, the, uh, uh, the, new, the new gates were taken down and the new uh, metal detectors were taken down. And access was restored on exactly the basis it, it's still somewhat restricted. It was restricted, but on exactly the basis on which it was taking place before that. This was a completely successful reimposition by nonviolent mass protest of the status quo vis-a-vis -vis access to the, whole, to, the to, to the Haram al-Sharif. Now, of course, Israel limits access to the Haram al-Sharif on a variety of other ways. It limits access of anybody from Gaza to the West Bank or Jerusalem. It limits access of most people from the occupied West Bank to Jerusalem under any circumstances for any reason. You have to get a permit. Most people can't get a permit. Uh, older people can, but most people can't. Uh, so those are tho th that's, that's, that's the elimination of most of the Palestinians living under occupation from any access to Jerusalem, let alone access to the Holy Sepulchre or to the Haram al-Sharif, to their holy places in Jerusalem. And then there are other degrees of limitation of access on Jewish high holy days. On Jewish and Israeli national holidays, uh, when the Israeli army sees fit, uh, when an incident has taken place somewhere else, access can be denied completely. The, the, in other words, nobody enters the Haram if they dis if they so if they so decide. Uh, and then there are other uh, forms of limitation. Uh, they've now set up right in front of my cousin's house on the way down to the Haram, about 20 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters away from Bab uh, They've set up a new a new barrier, and you can only go there during, past that during prayer time or if you live down that street. You can't go to a shop there. You can't wander through the haram. I mean, I used to cross the haram when I lived in that street. I used to cross through the haram to get to the parking lot near Baba Spot. You can't do that if you don't live in that street anymore. So it's kind of making that whole chunk of, of the center of, of the old city of Jerusalem essentially like downtown Hebron. Where Not quite, but we're getting there. Yeah. Yes, that, that's, a good, that's a good comparison. Um, where, where they essentially strangle the commerce and, and the daily life. They haven't yet done that uh, to that extent, but that's, that's the direction that they seem to be going. Okay, here's a tough question for you. How satisfied are you as an exiled Jerusalemite with the way the Palestinian leadership has dealt with the Jerusalem issue? Going back briefly perhaps to the Oslo Accords and until today. Um, I, I can answer that very, very, very quickly. Completely dissatisfied. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't think that this issue has been given the importance that it that it deserves. Um, I don't think that it's been given the importance that it deserves in Palestinian inter-Arab diplomacy or just diplomacy with the Islamic countries. There's a great deal of sentiment that can be that can be mobilized around Jerusalem, um, which the general Palestine issue sometimes can mobilize, but which is more acute where Jerusalem is concerned, and that w makes up for the relative imbalance of power between the Palestinians and Israel. Uh, 
to their credit, in the old days, the PLO managed to mobilize both third world Muslim and Arab sentiment around Jerusalem or around the Palestine issue. Unfortunately, in the last several decades, that's ceased to be the case. There just isn't the same focus on Jerusalem that there was before, and so I'm completely dissatisfied. I guess one thing I recall, I did a reporting trip to Jerusalem in 1995, you know, 18 months after the conclusion of the Oslo Accords, and that was the first time I saw checkpoints, semi-permanent and increasingly permanent checkpoints, cutting Jerusalem off from the rest That's of the West Kalandia. Bank. That's when the Kalandia checkpoint was established. And, and not, not just Kalandia, all around. All of them. So they, they, you know, they took Oslo as, a, as kind of giving them permission to put a ring of steel between. In fact, the closure of Jerusalem began while we were negotiating in Washington uh, in 92, 93, uh, before, before Oslo. So that process of choking Jerusalem off from its Arab, Palestinian Arab hinterland in the West Bank had actually begun even earlier in the negotiating process than Oslo. And then there was the whole issue. Uh, and we protested it here, and we, we told Tunis, you know, settlements, Jerusalem, there were two or three issues. We said to them, these are, these are, these are issues which cross the red line, which Secretary Baker had supposedly established as the ground rule for this negotiation. They changed the parameters. They changed the situation on the ground. They prejudiced and, 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 and prejudged outcomes that were supposed to be negotiated. We can't negotiate under these circumstances. And we, uh, we, we recommended to Tunis that they stop, that they say, we, we will not negotiate if you're closing Jerusalem. That prejudges and prejudices the outcome. It determines that Israel can control access to Jerusalem. The continuation of settlements in the same way uh, prejudges and prejudices. This is the language of the letter of uh, invitation to the Madrid <laughs> Peace Conference and of the letters of assurances that were given to the Palestinians, the letter of assurance that was given so to the Palestinians. So that was before they went off to the bilateral? 92, 93. Yeah, yeah. This is long before also. And then there was the whole issue of, of Orient House mm -hmm. and whether it has any status. Faisal Hosseini, Allah Yerhamu, whether he had a status as, as PLO representative in Jerusalem. So um, right now you have the uh, PLO's parliament in exile, or not in exile. <laughs> uh, the PNC is supposed to be meeting, um, I think, within about three or four days. On the 30th, supposedly. Yeah. Um, so are you ho hopeful that anything will come out of that to change or, or correct the PLO's negotiating strategy? Uh, much is needed to restore the status of the Palestinian National Movement. Uh, one thing that's needed is an end to this destructive and selfish and meaningless split uh, between these different factions. Another thing that is needed is to reverse the degradation of the PLO that has taken place over the decades since the Oslo Accords uh, were, were signed. Uh, back in 1993, the PLO uh, had was the sole rep legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, and it was a functioning body. Uh, it no longer is a functioning body. I mean, there's a Sandu al-Watani in Amman. There are a few institutions that, that, that operate. But this, is a, this, is a, this, this or some other body has to be revived as a representative of the entire Palestinian people. The PA is not a government. The PA is not sovereign. The PA has no jurisdiction legally. We tried in Washington to obtain jurisdiction. The Israeli delegation absolutely refused. And that's one reason we didn't reach an agreement. They gave up on that point in Oslo. So it has absolutely no legal standing to do anything. And it cannot, therefore, do very much because of that. The Palestinians need a leadership outside of the occupied territories, which is not under control of the occupation authorities, whose movements will not be determined by, yes, you may pass this checkpoint, or no, you will not. I will withdraw your VIP card, or I will give you another one, which is the status currently of the PA, and which can represent them in a situation where they're not subject to those pressures. Now, there are practical problems here. Where outside you can go, given the absolutely miserable state of governance in the Arab world, from dictatorship to absolute monarchy to to countries where the state has collapsed. You have in, in Libya and you have in Yemen and you have in Syria a situation of, of, of total chaos. Nevertheless, I think those are the, all things that the, that the Palestinian national movement has to do. 
uh, reestablish a presence outside, end the split, invigorate its institutions, reinvigorate its institutions, and finally come up with a strategy for dealing with the 21st century. Should it stay in the Oslo Accords? I personally think that Israel has so systematically violated the Oslo Accords that they're, as uh, uh, my one said, they're caduc. They're <laughs> they don't exist. Uh, he said it in a different context. I understand <laughs> that. I understand. He's talking about the about the Mithach but the, the the Palestine National Charter. But um, I I don't think the Oslo Accords exist. They serve only to to protect Israel and and its occupation. The security aspect of them is really the only fun. And then there is this, this, this governmental structure of self-rule, which is essentially Begin's autonomy plan implemented voluntarily by the Palestinians, um, and which excludes sovereignty, which excludes jurisdiction, which excludes control over territory or water or air or entry or exit or the population registers or anything else of any importance. You can collect the garbage. That's allowed. So the situation in Palestine, in Jerusalem and the rest of Palestine seems obviously pretty dire, but you've been here a long time in the United States. Um, you hold the Edward Said Chair at uh, Columbia University. Um, and Edward was always very insistent that civil society here in the United States was different from the government and that civil society could make a real difference. Mm -hmm. How do you see that situation right now in terms of the ability of Palestinian um, nationalists to actually reach out and, and win support mm. from civil society? Let me say one other thing before I answer that question, which is I, I see that the situation in Palestine is dire, but the grassroots activism and the mobilization of civil society in Palestine to me is very encouraging. Uh, what the BDS movement has done, what these protests in Gaza have done, shows that a spirit of resistance, a spirit of steadfastness, a spirit of unwillingness to accept the status quo permeates the Palestinian people. However miserable and, and superannuated their leadership may be, and it is, however lacking the Palestinian national movement is in terms of a strategy, I think those are encouraging factors. Now, I would say about the United States that it's true, Edward, of course, was right that civil society is completely different from the American government. Um, most Americans want gun control, but we're not going to have it. Most Americans, if they, if they th there are a variety of issues that you could talk about. Probably most Americans don't want wars all over the place. Probably most Americans don't want this size of a defense budget. I mean, I could go, one could go on and on and on, but those are things that are not going to change. So what civil society wants and what might happen in terms of policy may be two completely different things. But I do see quite remarkable changes in terms of American civil society on the issue of Palestine. And I'm not entirely sure that these have been motivated by Palestinians or Arab Americans or Muslim Americans, though they've played a big role. I think these have been motivated <laughs> largely by American Americans who are, especially young ones, who are smarter and more worldly and better traveled and more unwilling to accept the dogma peddled by the mainstream corporate media than their elders. Kids are smarter than we are. They're a lot smarter than we are. I mean, I, I know that because I teach. And so I see 19 and 20 year olds who are just a lot better in terms of their understanding of the world and the sources of information that they have access to than the generation of people in their 50s or 60s or 70s or even in their 40s. And I think that's produced a unwillingness to accept the sort of lemming-like leaping over the cliff in terms of all of these pieties vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine that their elders have swallowed over generations. Uh, the Israeli narrative is in real trouble in the United States, not because it doesn't have a powerful hold on the mainstream media. It does. Not because the entire political class, with a very few exceptions, hasn't drunk the Kool-Aid. They have. You know, they're going to they're gonna flock like sheep to the opening of the embassy. There will be scores of um, uh, representatives and senators in Jerusalem, I'm sure. Uh, but if you look at the grassroots of the Democratic Party, you see a completely different phenomenon than the party establishment. And that's true in many churches. That's true in many synagogues. That's true in a lot of universities and colleges. I mean, what's happening on campuses 
it shocks me. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised by what happened at my own university at, at Barnard. I'm surprised by what happened at Fordham, also in New York City. Pleasantly George surprised. Washington. <laughs> Shocked and surprised and pleased. But I, I would never have expected student activism to have, to have pushed things to this level. Um, and I, I see the same thing in many unions. I see the same thing in various sectors of civil society. Um, the, the, the Pew polls show this, actually. There's a, a series of polls last year, this year. Um, other polls are not quite as, you know, as, as categorical in, 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 in depicting a shift on the Palestine issue. But there is absolutely no question. As you go down the age, uh, uh, go from older to younger, there's a big change. And I cannot see that but accelerating. Because basically, most people have been sold a, 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 a version of reality based on, you know, uh, Leon Uris's miserable book, <laughs> Exodus, and a bunch of other tripe that was sold to them over generations. The d making the desert bloom, land without a people for a people without a land. I mean, a bunch of, a, a bunch of hokum. Plus some kind of post-Holocaust -hol guilt. Much else, much, much, much else. Mm -hmm. I mean, for that older generation, there are reasons why they came to believe what they believed. But much of that stuff just doesn't work with younger people. They want to know for themselves. And they go out and they find their own sources of information. Um, I mean, I'd love to think that the Journal of Palestine Studies, the Institute <laughs> of Palestine Studies, are the main source or a main source. I'd love to think that the Institute for Middle East Understanding or various other – your books. publishing house <laughs> Thank you. are the reasons for this. I think that the fact that they're doing well is a function of this. I think the reason for this is that younger people are going out and finding out for themselves. And to me, that's enormously encouraging. I mean, they come to me and they ask me questions that third, when I started teaching – I've been teaching for 44 years. Okay? I've been teaching in the United States since 1983. And their elders didn't ask me these questions. <laughs> they know things and know things to ask that, that people didn't know 20 and 30 years ago or 40 years ago. So I, I, I have to say I'm very encouraged. I don't think that means that we're going to have a shift in U.S. policy in 2018 or 2020. Uh, but I do think that it means – that the Palestinian narrative has a chance of spreading. If it, it, it's not the Palestinians who are spreading it. Uh, the Arab governments and the PLO have done and do absolutely nothing, to my knowledge, to spread the Palestinian narrative. It's being done by Palestinian civil society and by people in this country who are supporting Palestine and by people who are finding out on their own. Um, but that narrative is, is finally getting a little bit of traction. And the Israeli narrative is suffering enormous hits among its own core constituencies. Uh, I mean, I don't think you should overestimate uh, the actions of this actress or the actions of that group or whatever in the Jewish community, but there is clearly great dissatisfaction with the direction Israel has taken in terms of religion, in terms of nationalism, in terms of racism, in terms of uh, treatment of the American Jewish community, which are, I mean, these are, these are the canary in the coal mine. Uh, this is a core constituency. There are other constituencies. There are very important other constituencies for Israel. The arms industry in this country, the, the, the military-industrial complex, is a constituency of its own. Uh, the evangelical community is a constituency of its own. It's not like the American Jewish community is the only or even necessarily the main one. But it is a core constituency for Israel. And it, I'm not saying they've lost it or they're losing it, but things are changing within that community for reasons that don't necessarily have anything to do with the Palestinians. Um, I think we should um, say if people have uh, questions, if somebody is going to come and collect the questions, and if those could come up to me. I have one last question, well, two last questions for Rashid while that is happening. Um, one is, um, what actions or campaigns do, do you think that U.S. supporters of Palestinian rights should be focusing on both in the next three weeks and in, in you know, the next few months? I mean, I don't know what people should do in the short term. Um, but I, I think the point, the point of any activism that anybody is engaged in should just be to make the reality in Palestine and the, the background of that better known to larger numbers of people. You know, BDS in and of itself is important because it brings up issues that force people to educate themselves. The important thing is not necessarily that we get this university to divest or that 
there are sanctions taken against the State of Israel. I actually don't think that they're going to have those effects. But the effect in terms of education is just monumental. And I think that that's the most important thing, getting people to know more. I mean, the truth will out if they, if they have a chance to, to learn it. Uh, and the truth is really not on the side of the Israeli narrative. Th th there, are, there, are, there are things that are profoundly ugly in terms of American values. Uh, and you just have to read what an Ayelet Sheked, the Minister of Justice, says, or a Miri Regev, the Minister of Culture, says. Just read what they say. If people know what these people are saying, they will say, this is in complete contradiction to every value on which this country is founded. Or that's all you need. Or, for example, the, the orders given to Israeli snipers. W those are in contradiction to international law as well as values. I mean, uh, I, th I think this uh, amazing courage that the unarmed people of Gaza are showing has to be, has to be noted and applauded. Um, and another part of that is, is, to me, it just blows my mind to a certain extent to see Ismail Haniyeh and the leaders of Hamas on a big stage with Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And, and it is not solely um, cynical. I mean, I've actually talked with Hamas people, especially people in the Hamas women's networks, about some of what they've done in terms of nonviolent mass organizing. But to see them openly um, lauding these, these giants of, of nonviolence. I mean, we're, we're talking about the same kind of gulf between civil society and political leadership. Political, the civil society in Palestine has understood that the path of mindless, pointless diplomacy and the path of self-defeating violence actually is not going to liberate Palestine. Mm -hmm. You ain't going to get there that way. People understand that. Mm -hmm. Civil society understands that. The activists understand that. The politicians are chasing after them now because they realize that that's the way the people are going. Politicians will do that. <laughs> if they want to stay in power. <laughs> so we have a question from Steve France. Um, how do you see Israel trying to drive a wedge? It's a couple of linked questions. Israel trying to drive a wedge between Palestinian Christians and the global church leaders um, that have uh, leaders of the ch churches that have major assets in Jerusalem. Yeah. And secondly, what is the future of Bethlehem, which is kind of linked to Jerusalem? Well, it's part basic. of the corpus separatum. <laughs> yeah, I know. Under, <laughs> under 181 in 1947. Um, I, I don't know what the f I'm, I'm a historian. I'm the job description of a historian does not include predicting the future, so I don't know what the future of Bethlehem is. I'm sure it will continue to thrive one way or another. They're very resilient people. It's a very important site. Uh, inshallah, I mean, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm positive that one way or another it will, it will pull through in spite of the walls around it, in spite of the restrictions on entry and so on and so forth. Um, th the other part of the question um, attempts to drive wedges. Um, if, you, if you go to Ben Gurion Airport, which I have occasion to do every, every year or so, um, one of the things you'll notice is that the International Christian uh, what is it Embassy. Embassy has quite a presence there at the airport. It's very clearly a big entry point for you know, them that say people who have been, you know, are convinced that Israel is quite central to their belief system as evangelicals. Um, and I think that that focus uh, is going to continue to be very important for Israel because I think they, they understand that they've lost a lot of the mainstream Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. I think they understand that they'll never make much headway with the Catholic Church, though they, in the United States there are many people in the Catholic Church who are very uh, sympathetic to Israel. Um, and I think that they understand that they're going to have some problems in the Jewish community. And they're basically digging in and, and hunkering down with the Orthodox in the Jewish community. So wh what they're doing is cutting their losses and focusing on their assets. And I think that the, they see the evangelicals as a potential asset. And I, I think that what, what, what has to be done, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian and I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an organizer or an activist, but I think what has to be done is to focus both on mainstream churches, Catholic and Protestant, but also on va evangelicals, because there are a lot of evangelicals I think probably can be reached. And have been reached. I yeah, mean, no, have been, but also can be further. Right. Um, a lot of this is based on ignorance. A lot of this is based on being taken on magical mystery tours of Palestine. Um, and, you know, if you can get people off that beaten track, uh, I, I've, I've seen people, you know, 
conversion on the road to Jerusalem sort of things. They go to Palestine and they see something off the beaten track, not what APAC shows them, not what the environment, International Christian Embassy shows them. And they're shocked to the very core of their being. I mean, just taking them to Hebron is enough, frankly, to change anybody almost. I, I had this happen to a group of friends of mine from Chicago who were taken by some Jewish group, which by some, through some mistake, enabled them to meet with soldiers from breaking the silence, who took them to Hebron. And they all came back completely converted, completely changed as a result of one day in Hebron uh, with a soldier from breaking the silence, a former soldier from breaking the silence. So I, I, I think that uh, uh, in terms of working with churches, um, both continuation of some of the very good work that's gone on with mainstream Protestant denominations and uh, uh, further work with the Catholic Church because there are a lot of, lot of cardinals and a lot of senior leaders in the church here who uh, are thinking mainly of their local community, and they want to keep good relations with the Jewish community. And m again, the Jewish community is divided on this issue, but the leadership is reactionary on this issue, even if the, even if the rank and file are, you know, are, are moving in, in many cases in the right direction. And they have a very tough policy. If you don't take our position on Israel, we're going to call you anti-Semites. And that's a terrible accusation to have to bear. So a lot of work is necessary. Yeah, I had a discussion with uh, my friends Phil Weiss and Max Blumenthal once. Um, I guess this was at, at the Penn BDS conference back in the day in 2012. We were looking at these accusations. And if you're a, if you're a Jewish supporter in this country of Palestinian rights, you get called a self-hating Jew. And if you're a non-Jewish supporter, you get of Palestinian rights, you get called an anti-Semite. So we, we, we said, like, wh which hurts more? <laughs> um, and Six of one, half a dozen. Well, no, I, th I think, you know, being called an anti-Semites, number one, exist and have caused real damage to our Jewish friends. And, you know, that's a serious thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas self-hating Jew, like, what do they think that Max Blumenthal goes home and cuts himself with a razor? Like, no. <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, I think being ostracized from your community can be painful. That's I mean, true. I know people for whom family, uh, mm -hmm. family encounters, and you know, uh, uh, going to the synagogue and, and 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 discussing things can be very, very painful as a result of differences on this issue. So, um, moving right along here, we have a question came in from Facebook because, of course, as you all know, this is being live streamed on Facebook. Um, hi, out there, Facebook people. Um, so. John is asking, what does the U.S. get from its unconditional support of Israel? C if you could keep your answer to, like, three minutes or less, it'd be great. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, what does the United States get? I mean, the, the, best, the, best, you know, the best honest answer is a lot of tsuris, a lot of aggravation. <laughs> but that's not the real answer. That's a sarcastic answer. Um, American politicians get a great deal. And these are decisions made by pol politicians for political reasons. President Truman told a group of American diplomats in 1945, just after he uh, took office, uh, actually 1946, November 1946, before the November uh, 1946 midterm elections, he said to them, uh, I don't have a lot of people among my constituents who care about Palestine. I have a lot of people who care for the Zionist cause. Mm. And so what does the United States as a country get is a question I'm not, I, I'm not answering now. The politicians who make up uh, our presidents and our senators and our congresswomen and men uh, get a great deal in campaign contributions, in votes, in, in endorsements from APAC, from towing the line and from you know, following the orthodoxy on Israel. So that's the first thing. And you have to understand that that's very, very important to a politician. The national interest has, it doesn't mean a lot, but losing an election to these people means a great deal. Okay? The second thing is that Israel fits into a certain American imperial role. Has always done that since the 60s at least. That is to say, it has sold itself to American strategists and policymakers as a, as a policeman for American interests. Back in the days of the Cold War, this was in terms of we are your proxy and we will crush proxies of the Soviet Union. 
and that worked in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. That was the uh, unsinkable aircraft carrier in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean that served U.S. interests vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and its so-called proxies. Since the war on terror, Israel has another excuse for selling itself to the United States. In fact, American support for Israel has helped to provoke a lot of terror. So that's part of the tsuris, that's part of the aggravation that we're getting as, as blowback. And various American, senior American military officials, various people in the Department of Defense, when they had the courage to say it, said, this costs American lives. And I think in a, a couple of, of, of senior, senior military officers said this when the United States was mired in the Iraq occupation of Iraq. Um, and it was true. Uh, but nevertheless, Israel manages to sell itself as, a, as not just an ally, but the vanguard of, of, of this war on terror. Mm -hmm. So there are various ways in which, in which this, is, this is peddled and, and branded uh, as, a, as an asset to, 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 to the United States. Um, we have a question about the two-state solution. Does the collapse of the two-state solution require any rethinking of Palestinian nationalism and its goal of an Arab Palestine? I think uh, three minutes or less. Rethinking, <laughs> rethinking is always necessary, mm -hmm. um, and it's particularly necessary now. Uh, I think I think that Palestinians and Palestinian supporters, but especially Palestinians, should be thinking about how Israel's actions, which have made a two-state solution impossible, and Israel's creation of a one-state reality over the past fifty years, has impacted. Uh, 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 the, the aspirations for an independent Palestinian state. Uh, I would argue that they have made those aspirations almost unrealizable, that a two-state solution is, a, a, as a result of Israel's actions, almost entirely supported completely by the United States. That, that, uh, uh, they've created a new reality. But I think there's something else, which is to say this idea of an Arab Palestine, I think that has to be fundamentally rethought too. It's not going to be an Arab Palestine. There are two peoples there. Mm -hmm. This was a colonial settler project. This is still a colonial settler project, but it's created a national reality. You like it, you don't like it. This is a colonial settler state. The United States of America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia are successful colonial settler states that have created national entities. The fact that it has that heritage doesn't make it illegitimate. It means it has to look at its history. It has to deal with its history. It should presumably repent and pay for its history. But it doesn't change the fact that this is a national entity. That's also true of Israel. That doesn't mean that Israel, as it is today, uh, 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 can, can be allowed to continue doing what it's doing to, to, to the Palestinians. Th there has to be a dismantling of all of those colonial settler structures. But the idea that this is a, a purely and solely Arab country, we have to come to terms with the fact that that's not a reality anymore. There's so an Israeli reality in Palestine. There's a Palestinian reality in Palestine. How you, How you square that circle is not for me to say, it's not only for the Palestinians to say, but they have to decide how they want to address that. I mean, there was a seminal moment in South Africa in the um, ANC's history in the 1950s when they took a big gulp and they said, you know, it's not going to be possible to expel the white settlers. We need to think of a vision that includes them in a situation of civic equality. Is that a, a, a kind of a precedent? It, it could be a precedent, but it, it was easier for the South Africans because they were an overwhelming majority, and half of them hadn't been expelled from their country. Um, we're not an overwhelming majority, and half of us have been expelled from our country. And the colonial settler process in the South African case, at a certain point, came up against insuperable international and local obstacles the wars that South Af Africa was fighting, the repression of the Ar African majority, and the international support that South Africa got, all were insuperable obstacles. Israel has not yet come up against those kinds of obstacles. The, the project, the, the colonial settler project, is ongoing all over the West Bank and Jerusalem. The international support that Israel has has in some ways expanded its relations with Russia, its relations with China, its relations with Central Asian countries, its relations with India are excellent. So even if it's, in my view, losing a lot of support in Europe and the United States, it is trying to make up for that internationally. So until and unless you see that process slowed, it's, it's hard to be as magnanimous and as broad-minded as the South Africans were. 
Uh, that was a remarkable leap that they took with the ANC. And uh, Palestinians are not ready to make that, and strategically it's, hard, it's, it's easy to understand why that might be the case. Mm. A sort of a related question here, um, given that you don't predict the future, but somebody wants to know, do you expect a smooth transition after Abbas? Which we could say is, what, what do you expect? What I have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> waste anybody's <laughs> time, you know, blathering. I, I have no idea. Um, we have a question about what is the role of Palestinian businessmen, maybe we should reframe that as business executives in the PA, um, and, and do, they, do they play a, a, a positive role? I mean, I think one of the most regrettable aspects of the PA has been its adoption of a neoliberal model and its attempt to integrate into a system of domination of the Palestinian economy by the Israeli economy. And its failure to try and create, a, I don't want to say a separate or an independent economy, that's impossible in a situation of occupation, but an economy that's more resilient and more self-sufficient and that would sustain resistance. And by resistance, I don't mean armed resistance, I mean samud. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and hanging on mm -hmm. to pa Palestine. Um, instead, what it has done is to create a situation where inequality has grown, where dependence on bank loans and car loans and housing loans has increased, and so people are afraid to challenge the status quo because they'll lose their home or they'll lose their car or they owe too much money to the bank. Um, and where there is an outsized degree of influence for um, Palestinian uh, capitalists. Um, I mean, they have an important role to play, but that should be shaped by the state. And we don't have a state, state <laughs> but we have a Palestinian authority. It doesn't have sovereignty. It doesn't have jurisdiction. But it has some control over the form of economy mm -hmm. that can be created under Israeli domination, under Israeli occupation. It can be neoliberal and more unequal and leading to greater dependence or it can be more egalitarian, more socially oriented, and leading to greater self-sufficiency. And unfortunately, it's more gone in the former direction than the latter. What do you say to people who, who claim that the creation of the PA actually relieved Israel of a huge amount of its responsibilities under the Fourth Geneva Convention to oversee the welfare and not just survival, but well-being of the residents of the occupied territories, because now the PA is wholly um, funded externally from you know, exactly. Europe and Japan. So all those economic pressures that we saw during the first intifada, where actually maintaining the occupation became expensive for Israel, those kind of economic pressures have, have now been relieved. Uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, if the Oslo process had led to independent statehood, then a limited period during which uh, something like this happened might have been acceptable. But it should have been very clear and has become clear that that's not where that process led to. Mm -hmm. This was a process to deepen occupation and entrench colonization rather than end it. And a process to, to finally end and fully subjugate the Palestinians rather than liberate them. That's what Israel understood of this. That's not what the, the Palestinian leadership thought it was doing, but they were wrong and the Israelis were right. And it was you know, my, the balance of forces that determined that outcome. Um, question, is there a chance to revoke the 501c3 status um, of all these settler supporting, settlement supporting organizations and to revoke no. APAC status to become a bona fide foreign agent, registered foreign agent. Um, There's a very interesting history of the f of, of APAC status. At the beginning, it was considered an agent of a foreign power. And some very interesting things happened during the Eisenhower administration. I won't bore you with the history. Um, but I think the 501c3, I'm not a lawyer. My daughter's a lawyer. Some of my best friends are lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. But I understand that if the case is, pick is chosen properly, a case could be made. The problem is some of this ends up being administrative law, which means the political appointees who are more worried 
about their bosses getting reelected and campaign contributions and votes rather than the law might determine the outcome. But uh, I, I think that, that a, a properly crafted challenge, friends of the IDF, for example, <laughs> uh, to an institution that is manifestly not charitable uh, might conceivably have a chance. I'm not a lawyer, so I, 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 I couldn't say that with assurance. Um, I want to bring this back to Jerusalem and the fact that in about two and a half weeks, we're going to have this fanfare of the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. What would you call on American citizens to do to make their feelings, their criticisms of this felt most effectively? That's a very hard question. Um, I'm not sure what citizens should do. I mean, I think, you know, informing themselves of some of the somewhat abstruse background to this. I mean, the degree to which this represents is, is probably a good thing. And making those facts known is a, is a good thing. How you would protest it, what you do, I, I, it's not for me to say. Um, but this is, a, this is a quite remarkable departure from the policy of every single president since President Truman, including President Truman. Um, there was an insistence on the part of the United States government from 1947 until 2017 that the status of Jerusalem must be decided by uh, uh, an agreement before the United States would take a position on the issues of sovereignty and, uh, and where the capital of Israel and any other possible entity might be. And changing that and going against decisions taken by the United States government in supporting Security Council resolutions, condemning what Israel has done in Jerusalem, it just reverses Seven, literally 70 years of policy. Uh, I think people should, you know, let that sink in. I mean, what is being done here in terms of international law, in terms of American commitments? Uh, uh, one of the questions that's been raised about the Iran, uh, the, the, this, this president's uh, desire apparently to renege on the Iran, Iran arms, de on the Iran nuclear deal, is the argument that who will, who will take the word of the United States if a, a, a solemn agreement like this, which is enshrined in a Security Council resolution, is simply violated by the United States. I think the same argument has to be made about this Jerusalem issue. I mean, this is not just a reversal of policy. It's a violation of international law, which the United States made, what President Macron said in Congress down the, down the, way, down the way here uh, the other day b before a joint session, saying, these are international laws you made. You have to respect them. You made them. You are tearing up the fabric that you constructed here in Washington, uh, since Yalta, since uh, Bretton Woods, since all of these. Uh, the United Nations is an American creation. It's not a Russian creation, Soviet creation. It's not a British or French. It's an American creation. President Roosevelt and his successors created this structure, however good or bad it may be. And Trump is just merrily, merrily dismantling a structure that has been in place in the case of Jerusalem and in the case of international law for 70, 75 years. Uh, I think those are serious things. Uh, I think that Jerusalem is more important even than Jerusalem because of this. I, I think maybe one thing people could do as a, you know, as a very immediate step would be to see their own representatives and senators. Are they going to the opening ceremony? Have they right. said anything about moving the, the embassy? Because a lot of them have been very supportive of moving the embassy. As we know, there's been congressional resolutions since the House for a long time supporting this. I, th I th think we can probably do some, something at the level of engagement. They actually listen when people call and write. One of my last communications with someone who was then the junior senator from Illinois, <laughs> had to do with something that was going through the Senate uh, relating to Gaza in 2015, 16, I forget when it, it was. Just remind people, what was the guy's name? It would be Barack Hussein Obama. Oh, got it. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, it's one of the last times I had any, I had any conversation with him uh, back in, this is now a long time ago. Um, I, I said 2015, though. It was, no. it was when he was a senator, so 2007 or six or five, two years before he was elected president, or a year and a half before he was elected president. And he said, I haven't gotten any pressure from the other side on this. All of the calls and all of the letters and all of the visits to my office have been by people who want me to vote in favor of some. It was some horrific resolution that AIPAC had written. You know, once upon a time, 
uh, resolution was actually passed that was still on a, a, where the where the draft was still on APEC later, letterhead. They had written it, and the senators or the Congress people just passed it. Um, and so they do listen. They really do listen. And even a few letters, even it, just the idea that there are people out there who vote and who are politically aware and who are watching what they and do. are watching what they do actually has an impact. Uh, now, I, I honestly don't expect that 18 and 19 year olds in my classes who are uh, involved in Palestine issues and some of whom may never have voted or even be too young to vote to do this. But adults, you know, mature adults who vote and pay taxes. Uh, actually have a responsibility to do this mm -hmm. if, if they feel strongly on these issues. And it has an effect. I think, although we have a lot of questions that I haven't had time to ask, that it's probably a good time to wrap up now. Um, we want people on Facebook not to get terrifically bored, but it's been great to have the people on Facebook and the people that are going to watch this later. Um, Julia Pitner, I guess it's for you to wrap up. <laughs> Yes, it is. Unfortunately, I mean, this has been a very enjoyable conversation, um, and I know there are lots of questions still. And it's clear that uh, you know there are a lot of issues and and uh, things um, that are happening in Palestine that are happening in this country that still need a lot of discussion and thoughtfulness. And the Institute of uh, Palestine Studies is very keen to continue to have these kinds of discussions um, with with uh, the, the converted and the non-converted, um, because I think together all of us should be looking at these very um, large issues that have been brought about by um, Jerusalem as the microcosm of Palestine, but also the microcosm of lots of challenges at the international uh, level as well. I'd like to thank all of you for coming um, and sharing your afternoon with us. Thank you to the friends on Facebook. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your being also with us, and thank you for sending your questions. And um, we look forward to, to seeing you all again. Thank you very much to Rashid and Helena for a great uh, discussion.